particularly face persecution and in face it sometimes Get back with me sometime. When I look into your holiness. When I look into your holiness. How beautiful that is. Thank you. Alice and I have been blessed to have Carmen at the piano with us for 30 years. And Mick and Burl. And Mick and Burl have been with us for a little more than 30 years, helping us at the children's choir and... Uh, at the keyboard. And who says the Lord doesn't show grace? Thank you very much. We invite your attention to Psalms chapter 46. What a great psalm this is. From these verses, Martin Luther penned, A mighty fortress is our God. And from some of the theology of Martin Luther and John Calvin, and St. Augustine, some of the concepts in the 47th Psalm play a very important role. So let's really pay attention to this beautiful piece of poetry. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam. Though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy dwelling places of the Most High. God is in the midst of her and she will not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations made an uproar, the kingdoms tottered. He raised his voice and the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has wrought desolation in the earth. He makes wars to, see, he makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. I want you to know that I have been honored this past week. I want you to know that my cover has been exposed. I got a letter from the Americans United for Separation of Church and State to remind me how I'm supposed to preach. And here I thought I had my cover, and I was going to rise up and stir up this hotbed of political activity and overturn the system and create a theocracy not known since David himself. But most of the stuff I knew, but the one thing that I evidently had forgotten was that I could preach much more politically than I have. The only thing that I can't do is try to sway an election one way or another. Now, how in the world are you going to talk uh, without having some kind of impression one way or another? Now, what all of this is about, and I really want you to know that I did a little bit of hyperbole here. It just says, dear religious leader. It didn't say, hello, Brother Don. So it wasn't really very personal. But it got me to thinking about how intensely people are looking toward this election time. I personally can't remember such intensity since the days that President Kennedy was running for office. I don't know that there has ever been a time when I've heard Christians talk. And the thing that I notice is they seem worried. They just seem to be really intense and worried. And I'm thinking to myself, why? And there's a good answer for that. But I want us to be able to look at these things in terms of a biblical perspective. And this is why we pointed out that in terms of theology and Christian living, St. Augustine looked to this particular chapter, as did John Calvin and Martin Luther, 
to establish a theology of two kingdoms, two cities. And that St. Augustine pointed out that we are members of two cities, the city of man and the city of God. And we need to have our priorities straight, for one is temporary and the other is not. One is established, as St. Augustine would put it, by none other than Cain himself. He was driven to the land of Nod, the land of wandering, and in that temporary setting in the land of wandering, he tried to establish a city. And so we have these two. In thinking about this, I put the question to myself, who are we? Why are we here? And what is our responsibility? And then the question came to mind. Am I a Democrat, a Republican, or an Independent who happens to be a Christian? Or am I a Christian who happens to be a Democrat, a Republican, or an Independent? There's a whole lot of difference on the outcome of those questions. And we need to keep that in mind. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our duty while we are here? And so I pointed out that the believer has the mindset of the pilgrim. And the mindset of the pilgrim understands the temporary situation in which he or she finds himself. But the believer, as a pilgrim, has another outlook. And the mind of the pilgrim has a focus, and that focus is on God, not upon party politics. And that focus is on the city of God, above all else. And that focus is on the purpose of God, and to understand that we are a part of that purpose, and our own thought patterns must conform to the purpose of God. And we should never lose sight of these things. The mind focused on God. For the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah, set to Almath, a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Some have basically said we're taking a turn that we will be no longer a democratic republic. Others say, hooray, that's good. And finally, for us, in a way, the question is, so what? It's so what in this respect, that we have a refuge, that we have God. He is our refuge, he is our strength, very present help in trouble. Notice that in some, he is present. Some have said, we always live in our own eternal present. Now, isn't that a great philosophical thought? Who cares, except to say, things come and things go. And we look at things as they come, we look at things as they are here, and we look at things as they are past. What we need to know is that God is always near. And in those times when we are challenged, He is present. In those times when we are challenged, he is there. When things seem overwhelming, he is our refuge. When it seems that our strength is insufficient, his strength is more than sufficient. He enables us to rise to the troublesome occasion. So why are we rubbing our hands together? This is where God has called us for this time and for this place. And this is not the time to run around and say, oh, woe is me, things are undone. They may be, but what for the pilgrim? What for the focus of the pilgrim? What of the focus on God? What of the focus on the city of God? What of the focus on the purpose of God? He enables us to rise to the troublesome occasion and to be who we ought to be and to do what we ought to do and the outcome is his. Even when we look at the core of Christian living, what does Paul say? 
One man plants, another waters. But who gives the increase? Is it the planter? Is it the waterer? It is God who gives the increase at his time and at his place. What's the problem? And he is the source of our courage as we are on our way. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, and though the mountains slip into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its swelling pride. He is our source of courage on our pilgrimage. All things may change, and they don't always change the way we would like them. You know that and I know that. We've had enough setbacks and hardships in our own life to know that the Christian walk does not exempt us from those things. What is at hand and what is our responsibility is to know that God is there and he is sufficient for our every need and he gives value and meaning to something that looks totally and absolutely meaningless. All things may change. The very foundations of our lives apparently may crumble. And it looks like chaos ensues. But the pilgrim remains fearless and confident. Notice, this, notice that this is a complex if-then clause. Even if this. But the conclusion comes first by way of emphasis. But let's change it around a little bit. Even though the earth should change, and even though the mountains should slip, slip into the heart of the sea, and even though its waters roar and foam, and even though the mountains quake at its swelling, we will not fear. Even though our entire lives look like it falls into the pits of chaos itself, we will not fear. Why? Because the Lord is present. And not only that, but notice that the Lord is the emphasis. God is our refuge in the times of the chaos and the turmoil. God is our strength to at least give us balance when nothing within our own existence can do so. And wherever there is trouble, we are never alone to face it in our own strength and in our own wisdom. He is there. Now, no matter how things turn out, we who are here today and confess Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, we also must maintain our focus on Him. And then, as they say, let the chips fall where they will because we will emphasize now and in the Sundays ahead. Remember Psalms 115.3, God is in heaven and He does as He pleases and what He does is good. We need to have our minds focused as well on the city of God. For this is really our task. This is what gospel and good news is all about. We are here to say, guess what? There are two cities, the city of God, the city of man. One had a beginning definite point of starting, and that one will have an ending point. The other one is the everlasting city. And the good news is, if you, don't, if you are not a part of that citizenship, you can be. And so we need to keep mind focused on the city of God for our own spiritual strength and well-being and for the hopes that others will unite in the city of God. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy dwelling places of the Most High. And God is in the midst of her. And she will not be moved, and God will help her when morning dawns. And of course you recognize that here we find the very seeds of those great pictures that we find in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. The city of God, the new Jerusalem, adorned as a bride where God dwells in the midst of his people and he personally wipes away every tear and he removes all sorrow and that city comes down to dwell with man. This is our message. God is present in that city 
and the city is the dwelling place of God. He is not a visitor there. He is not a snowbird there. Praise God for that. You people tricked me. When I came here, you said we got snowbirds. They leave around the spring and come back in the fall, but none of you told me about how many of you leave during the summertime. Shame. It's permanence. It's permanence that we're after. Solomon in the book of Ecclesiastes points out that out of all of the good times that come and go and the bad times that come and go in chapter 3, he finally says, God has placed the sense of eternity in the heart of every man, woman, and child. And that sense of eternity keeps them restless until they meet the eternal God and that eternal city. And the fact that he is there, it is his and he will not depart. And it is the presence of God that is the source of permanence and stability for your life and mine as individuals, for this congregation, and for the people of God and the church of Jesus Christ around the world. And God provides for his city. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy dwelling place is on high, for God is in the midst of her, and she will not be moved. And after the dust of this age settles, and when the last political convention has come to a close, they will be unnecessary, they will be unneeded, and all of those in their political parties and hats and pins will be no more. And the only real gladness that remains is the river whose streams make glad the city of God. Notice that unlike Thebes, unlike Damascus, unlike Nineveh, unlike Babylon, Jerusalem had no physical river. She had brooks and streams at best, but no river. But Jerusalem had more than a river to make her glad. For the people of God drink their fill of the abundance of your house. And you give them to drink of the river of your delights. And with you is the fountain of life. And in your light we see light. Continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. And it's not too hard to see Jesus Christ as the water of life. God's people drink their fill of the abundance of the Lord's house. And they drink from the river of his delights. For he himself is the fountain of life. For when we look at the center of the new Jerusalem, the city of God, and we see the throne Do we not see the throne straddling over a river that comes forth from the throne of God itself to give blessing and life and health to the people? And God's people depend totally and entirely upon his loving kindness and his righteousness. And this is where we will only find true and real righteousness. The mind of the pilgrim and the sojourner focuses upon God. The mind of the pilgrim focuses upon the city of God. For there is where we find our hope and from there is where we find our strength. And the mind of the pilgrim also focuses upon the purpose of God. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. We go back to that verse as a reminder that God's purpose has us in mind ever and always. As we see political thinking come and go, people themselves have value only of intrinsic worth. If you can do something for me, if you can do something for the country, you're important. If not, you're dispensable. 
But this is not the case with the purpose of God. For he is interested in redeeming his creation and he is interested in redeeming the heart of his creation, man, the image of God. And so we should not be surprised then that the Lord of hosts, and notice that, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the armies, is with us. And the Lord of the armies, he is victorious. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Those who want to make desolation have to step aside for the one who will succeed. And when he succeeds, he is the one who makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He is the one who breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two so that there is no instrumentality of destruction. And he burns the chariots with fire for war will be no more. The Lord of hosts is the one who is victorious. And he and he alone will be exalted among the nations. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations and I will be exalted in the earth. I was listening to the news while on the road and we have Japan and China squaring off a few islands that aren't really very large at all. And the commentator said they're doing it for national pride. There were other reasons, but I was taken by national pride. And how many of the nations strut around for national pride? But the day comes when it will end, when the Lord of hosts will be exalted. And all those nations who strive for pride must bow down to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. For his purpose is, I will be exalted in the earth and there will be no other option. Notice that in the opening of that Verse, cease striving. Notice that the striving is in italics. It's not there in Hebrew. The word that's there in Hebrew basically says enough. I've had it. Enough. Know that I am God. Know that I will be exalted among the nations and know that I will be exalted in the earth. And we, his people, rub our hands together in anxiety? We do so if and only if we forget who we are, why we're here, and what we're supposed to be doing. Our Lord is the King. For God is the King of all the earth. Be happy about that. Sing praises with a skillful song. God reigns over the nations and God sits on his holy throne. Notice what is happening now. He is the king of all the earth. We have people running around wanting to get democracy going here, democracy going there, to people who don't give a rip about it. And that's a temporary thing. For God, who once allowed the nations go their way, already is saying, look to the King of kings and the Lord of lords as the only Savior. And sing praises with a skillful song. Not just a little ditty, but give it some thought. Because we're talking about something that is majestic and regal and it's filled with splendor that your God reigns over the nations and he sits on his holy throne. And it's only a matter of time till no one will be confused. What then do we say to all of this as Christians? 
in the midst of the mounting turmoil throughout the world in our own country, let's remember who we are. I don't necessarily have the ability to change someone else's thought patterns, but I can challenge our own values. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. He who has the power to subject all things in itself has chosen to call us to himself and to change us to be more like him that we might fully enjoy and know the value of being a part of the everlasting city. We have an eternal life-changing citizenship in heaven. And that should be our priority. I know that over my lifetime as a Christian, I've heard people laugh and say, Oh, you Bible pounders, you holy Joes, you're looking forward to pie in the sky by and by. And I've come to understand that the only thing that they can look from the sky is some kind of a meteor that will blow us to bits. Now there's some good hope for you. You smoke on your pipe and I'll smoke on mine. But I think mine has substance. And we are no longer strangers and aliens of the heavenly city. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. I, knew, I know where I am. I know where I'm going to be. I know I am not everything that I ought to be, but I know that everything I ought to be, I will be by his grace. And you and I who confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we're fellow saints with the household of God. We are fellow citizens with the saints. And that's who I am and that's what my hope is all about. And for that reason, we are pilgrims and sojourners awaiting the arrival of that coming city. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. It's an interesting journey, isn't it? We're not a, we don't have an abiding, lasting, abiding place here. Nothing really lasts here. And we're on our journey to a city that comes to us. And we take full possession. For that reason, we're pilgrims and sojourners here and we should rejoice in our status as we eagerly await the arrival of that coming city and we look forward to that time when our Lord will return and he will be recognized as the Lord of all for this reason also God highly exalted him, meaning Jesus Christ our Lord, and bestowed on him the name or the status which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even the stiffest knee will bend with or without injections, with or without a saving relation, every knee will see that it can bend. And every soul will recognize Jesus Christ for who he is, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, believer and unbeliever alike. But one will bow the knee in triumph and victory and the other will bow the knee in tragedy and in process of being vanquished. And this is who we are on our journey. And let them laugh. 
Let them poke fun. But we still have the joy. And we should share the joy. And as time comes, I think it's going to get more difficult. And I wouldn't be surprised if all of a sudden we had a big brother with a bulging bicep. But when you take a look at church history and you see what brothers and sisters have gone through, the question is, so what? The reply is, bring it on. Not because I've got the strength or the wisdom in myself, but because I know who I am, I know why I'm here, and I know what I'm all about. And by God's grace and his grace alone, I can do it. So let's hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Let's be as faithful to him as he is faithful to us. We have a job to do. And above all else, and we'll touch on this, but above all else, we need to know who we are. We are a part of that holy nation that has been called out of darkness into his marvelous light with the purpose to declare his majesty. And that term used for majesty there means to declare his moral virtue. And our interest is not so much in politics as it is to injecting virtue and morality into a system that doesn't want it. And to the extent that we remain faithful, we've done our job. We, we plant, we water, and God brings forth the produce when he wants and as he wants. So from this congregation... From this day forward, no more rubbing our hands together in anxiety. Step out. Know that we are pilgrims. And our focus is God. And we are on a specific journey. We know we are headed for the city of God. And we are here to be a part of God's purpose. And let's be sure that no one says, oh, well, it's in God's hands. We are his hands and feet by his sovereign decree. This is not intended to be political. It is that. But the person who is not political is the person who is not engaged in Christian living. Our Father... May we never lose sight of who we are. May we never lose sight of why we're here. May we never lose sight that we are part of your purpose. We pray that you'll use us. Use us to proclaim moral virtue. Use us to proclaim the goodness that represents you. Use us to proclaim your love and your grace as it is seen in Jesus Christ. And may we never speak of an easy, cheap salvation. May Jesus Christ truly be the Lord of this congregation and the Lord of our lives. In his name we pray and ask these things. Amen.